Welcome to today's conversation about how Middle Tennessee becomes a smart region. Brought to you by the Transit Alliance of Middle Tennessee, the Greater Nashville Regional Council, and Hitch Rewards. To kick off our program today, this is Jessica Dauphin, President and CEO of the Transit Alliance. You all, uh, today's event, this event is so special. and I was thrilled when I was approached uh, to bring this super sneak peek at something brand new for our region to the Transit Alliance audience. As you and I know, changing not just the infrastructure of our regional transportation system, but the daily habits of residents, it takes a village and literally all the creativity that we could muster and put together. In terms of a smart city to a smart region and how do we get there and how does that support enhanced transit and connect with the Transit Alliance's mission? I'll say, in an era of smartphones and smart TVs and smart cars, it is about time that we invest in smarter commutes. This new program uh, with the GNRC, the Greater National Regional Council, is just that, leveraging homegrown technology that's been proven effective at motivating, but more importantly, sustaining behavior change and then creatively funding it with federal dollars. It's imperative for Transit Alliance partners, contributors, and TCLA alumni to understand how this works because we are the thought leaders of the region. It's up to us to take this new development and deliver it to our communities and networks so we can help drive the success of this effort. Why? Because if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. Create demand for transit and you can state your case for more transit spending. I believe this direct incentive could quite possibly be that missing link to get us over the hill because nothing is going to change until we do. Expecting transit funding improvements is not a pipe dream, y'all. 15 of 18 transit referendums passed on November 3rd, bringing the total number of transit referendums in 2020 to pass to 32. 32 cities have voted to increase either their taxes or their borrowing limits to fund transit improvements because they understand that transit is essential. And that's an incredible number during this year of COVID to boot. I just want to say if Middle Tennessee is to remain competitive with other regions of comparable size and, and populations, we must show success in our efforts to bear fruit in terms of transportation improvements. The heart of Tennessee is poised to pioneer a new incentive-based way to reward particular commuter choices that benefit the region's transportation objectives. So while I grasp the unique and enviable position that this puts us in, trust me, other cities wish they had the tech genius and strategic prowess combination of Hitch and the Greater National Regional Council. They don't, we do. So while I grasp what this could mean, I don't have all of the language to give to you and describe in detail what that process is. Lucky for us, those folks are here with us today. So up next is Sean Falser, Transportation Planner with the Greater Nashville Regional Council. And then after that is Mark Cleveland with Hitch. Good afternoon, um, Sean Falser with the Greater Nashville Regional Council. I've had the opportunity of the over the course of this year to give several presentations to TCLA, um, primarily focused on the GNRC's responsibility and role as the metropolitan planning organization uh, for the greater Nashville area. And we carry out a lot of the transportation planning activities within the region. Um, a lot of those presentations over, over the past year have been focused on our long range transportation plan um, given that we've been updating that over the course of the past year. And that really lays out kind of the framework for the region, um, the goals and objectives to guide federal transportation investments over uh, the next 25 years within the region. And so um, while that conversation is often focused um, at a pretty high or sometimes abstract level, it's exciting today to kind of talk um, more about the implementation on this exciting project to help us achieve some of those um, desired outcomes, um, such as mitigating congestion, increasing access to economic opportunity, and, and minimizing impacts on, on vulnerable populations and the environment. And so um, a lot of, uh, just to give a quick background, a lot of our traditional solutions and approaches to solving these 
These goals have focused on roadway, transit, bike ped, infrastructure investments. Um, but there was a, a push from a lot of the board members um, over the past couple of years to increasingly look towards additional uh, tactics and solutions to address those problems, um, such as leveraging technology, um, implementing policies and regulations, and utilizing strategies like incentives and rewards um, to um, change, change behavior. And so uh, one thing that they did was to carve out some funding to advance um, other solutions with uh, the update of our last transportation plan. And that set aside funding for a program called the Transit and Technology Program um, with a goal of helping to accelerate the deployment of some of the emerging technology um, and improving transit options and, and opportunities to reduce single occupancy vehicle travel. And so uh, last year in 2019, we kicked off a first round of the solicitation for that program and awarded, awarded funds uh, for that program, including um, approximately $2 million in surface transportation block grants funds for HITCH, uh, which are federal transportation funds uh, from the MPO's po uh, pot of discretionary funding. And that's a 80 per 20% um, federal, federal local match and the the focus of the, the of that grant to hitch was to expand their platform across the region and so we're really excited and you'll hear a little bit more today um, and through the video about um, the the potential benefits in expanding that platform through the utilization of incentives and rewards additional data coming back to our organization to do the transportation planning work that we focus on as well as better connecting with uh, some of the customers within the region. So with that, I will turn it over to the CEO of Hitch, uh, Mark Cleveland. Let me just say thank you, Jessica, for putting uh, this together. This is an intimate experience. It's not intended to be a giant uh, event. It is trying to get thought leaders access to insight and what's unique and happening here in, in Middle Tennessee. I'm thrilled to bring the uh, chief Digital Officer of Toyota, Dr. James Kuffner, forward into this limited uh, share. He's uh, responsible for the Woven City Project for the entire uh, global entity called Toyota and for all their autonomous vehicle projects. And we want to talk today about, okay, there's a smart city. There's a lot of things that are happening in the smart city, but this is an example, we think, of, of what a smart region looks like. But this is your advanced insight, and we're going to tell you a little bit about what Hitch is and, and move really quickly into where we are headed as a community, a smart region. Thank you. get to work. How do we get them there? Our solution is already in place. There's a road to almost every home. There are 273 million cars on the road today. It's a good place to start. A car is in almost every household, and there are family members, friends, and co-workers who are able to drive and ride together within trusted circles. The newly coined COVID car term is going to be driven among these trusted circles, and that's how we're going to get to work for a long time. At Hitch, we say, embrace that and make it work because it is working. So I'd like to welcome now to the stage our first guest who will speak about the costs and what we've learned from the data. He is Charlie Apigian, the director of 
MTSU's Data Sciences Institute. Charlie, we'll pull you up from your table and welcome, and please share with the team what you've learned from studying the data. How do we, um, how do we make change happen? Thanks, Mark, and thank you so much for the opportunity. I have uh, been involved with Hitch since its inception back uh, in early 2018 when they started collecting data through the Data Science Institute at MTSU. And Mark was uh, first and foremost looking at being a data-driven startup. And we had the opportunity to look at his data from day one to really see if incentivizing people to ride share does make a difference. Hitch wanted to see what is the true cost of incentivizing uh, riders to, to make a difference. And also, did they build a system that was robust enough to not only handle just ride sharing, but other forms of mobility, such as obviously solo rides, um, contract tracing, if it needed to go to that, or at least a pledge before you started driving. Could it um, uh, help with mass transit, biking, walking, anything that you can imagine? The other thing that we looked at doing this uh, summer was helping the US uh, DOT with a report that they were doing on ride sharing. And we were able to dive really deep into what matters to help continue to make a difference in terms of mobility. During that time, we looked at over 12 million total miles that were in the Hitch uh, system. That's 15,000 uh, different users, and it was 357,000 unique trips that were part of that initial pilot uh, program. So let me give you the, uh, uh, the, the good nuggets. And when you look at it per mile, what we found is a major jump between a penny and two cents. And once you got to two cents a mile for each of the riders, it continued to in incrementally go up to about five cents uh, to make a big difference. But that was really the sweet spot that we saw is between two and five cents and two being the minimum that it would cost to truly incentivize. And we saw a sustained use and sustained use to us was were they still using it in three months, six months. And we saw that if you were paying somebody two cents a mile, 48% were still using it in three months. 33% were still using it in six months, which we thought was pretty big. So what does two cents mean? Well, let's say that the average user, their trip is 14 miles per trip. They average 177 miles uh, for the month. And if you look at 177 miles for the month at two cents, you're talking about $3.54 per user. If you wanted to incentivize 1,500 different users at two cents a mile, that would cost you $5,000 per month. And with that, let's get to the other good stuff in uh, uh, our presentation today. Thank you so much for letting me dive into this data and being part of this journey to get us to where we are today. I look forward to seeing what the next steps are. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. I really appreciate it. Now I'd like to welcome to the stage Michael Skipper. He's the Executive Director of the Greater Nashville Regional Council. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today with you. Like Charlie, I've been uh, with you at the, the very early stages of Hitch, and I've had the chance to see it evolve over time into what has really turned into an amazing rewards incentive program to drive good behaviors across uh, our, our region here in Middle Tennessee as well as across the nation with respect to transportation. And I know you've got even, even bigger ideas for the use of Hitch as a platform to incentivize behaviors even beyond mobility. We are looking forward to uh, deploying Hitch across Middle Tennessee uh, in, a, in a broad sense. We've had a few pilot projects that have been mostly employer driven over the last couple of years, but um, as, a, as a result of a, an opportunity through a federal grant program that we manage at the Greater Nashville Regional Council, we now have uh, an opportunity to look at how we can affect behavior sort of at a larger scale across Middle Tennessee. Just as a way of introduction, uh, again, I'm Michael Skipper with the Greater Nashville Regional Council, which is a council of governments for 13 counties and 52 cities across uh, Nashville, Middle Tennessee, one of the most important responsibilities we have to Middle Tennesseans is in carrying out the Federal Metropolitan Planning Organization uh, programming for our metropolitan areas. As, as many of you that are signed on today know that, you know, sort of uh, since, the, since the 60s, the federal government has been 
increasingly delegating decision-making authority for how federal gas tax dollars are spent on transportation projects to local governments within metropolitan areas across the nation. And they're, they're asked to do that in cooperation with each other and the state DOT and transit agencies. And so our role in that is to facilitate that collaboration amongst the transportation stakeholders in our region and to allocate the federal funds that we expect to come our way uh, tomorrow and 25 years down the line. Um, since 2010, in, in this role, what we've elected to do is to set aside 30% of a particular Federal Highway Administration grant that comes to Tennessee in all states in America, but 30% of the money from the surface transportation block grant program that flows to uh, our region uh, is set aside uh, and dedicated to projects that are aimed at improving active transportation choice within Middle Tennessee or accelerate the deployment of technologies um, uh, for public transit, uh, transportation demand management, traffic operations. So we're looking at emerging technology, trying to figure out how to pilot or sort of accelerate their deployment uh, through, through this 30% set aside. So we've been doing that since 2010. And more recently, about a year ago, our board um, held a, a completed sort of a, a process, a, con a competitive process where it looked for uh, proposals from across the region for how to spend about five years worth of this money on technology solutions that were specifically aimed at transportation demand management or outreach and engage engagement with the community uh, to uh, better brainstorm and collaborate with uh, local neighborhoods on transportation solutions that would be beneficial uh, to, to, to their personal life. And so as a result of that competition, which Mark and Hitch applied for uh, our Transportation Policy Board, which oversees that NPO process and allocating federal grants to transportation projects across Middle Tennessee, elected to award about a million and a half dollars in federal funds to Hitch uh, in exchange for uh, a, a broad scale deployment of this rewards or incentive uh, program. And so um, we had a few objectives that we we're trying to achieve uh, through this initiative. One was we wanted to figure out a way, sort of low cost way of addressing some of the very specific transportation challenges it's frankly hard to address through big roadway construction projects or even big rapid transit projects that take some time to develop. We wanted to see what we could do to, at a low cost, uh, begin to drive changes in personal choice with respect to commuting to work. Uh, and so our, our intent is to use Hitch, design uh, financial incentive reward rules that incentivize people for carpooling or transit usage uh, on the way to and from work. We also wanted to encourage or reward people uh, in making personal choices that avoided peak travel times. And so we intend to use this, uh, this platform to basically vary the rate of reward based on the time of day that you're traveling. Uh, another thing that we're trying to do with the Hitch platform is to incentivize or reward people um, to go above and beyond, or maybe even a little bit of other way uh, to pick up a, a carpooler uh, that might be coming from uh, a part of the region that is traditionally underserved. And, and what we're really aiming at here is to make sure that people uh, they don't have really good access to cars and so low income folks or just people who've chosen to not have enough personal automobiles to go around the household. Let them benefit from uh, other people being incentivized to, to pick them up on their way to work. And then we're also exploring a, a few concepts that would reward freight uh, to better you know, take, take better advantage of the, some of the recent roadway construction projects that we built and that go around the, the core of the region. Uh, what we see is you know, we built some, uh, some pretty big uh, bypasses, if you will, around the, the downtown urban core, but where truck drivers are sort of lagging behind in terms of their decision to use those facilities versus sort of continuing to blow through downtown, uh, downtown which is uh, significantly contributing to particularly those peak travel periods that we experience or did experience pre-COVID. Um, but we do have, beyond just the idea of changing travel behaviors, a few additional objectives that we wanted to achieve with the platform. One is we wanted to establish a more direct relationship with users of the system, which is one of the sort of byproducts of Hitch, is the ability to talk directly to Hitch users. And what I mean by this is that we can periodically uh, check in with them with a poll here or there to understand like what their experiences are on the roadway. What are the day-to-day -day challenges that they're experiencing as a commuter or somebody who's trying to get around the region? So uh, that ability to talk directly with commuters through the 
do the application, I think is going to be big, especially knowing that they're already bought in. They're more likely to pay attention to us when we're, we're seeking their input into uh, either the planning process or just, just to better understand their experiences. And then another benefit from the uh, platform that we're looking forward to, to taking advantage of is just the enormous amount of data that's going to be collected from the users of the system, just passively, the, the origins, the destinations, the travel speeds, the routing data that's going to come along with uh, the system to augment the, the traffic modeling that we're doing that's traditionally based on household travel surveys that are very infrequently conducted to assess sort of the behaviors of our region. So it's a little bit more real-time understanding of what's really going on. Of course, that'll be greatly supplemented by big data that we're getting from uh, the mobile device data that's out there as well. But, you know, before I turn it back over to Mark, uh, again, want to thank Mark and Hitch, everybody at Hitch really for their leadership on this issue. I, so I just really love how Hitch kind of stuck with the problem statement and kept innovating to a point where we're fully bought in. Uh, and I, I'm really proud of our city and county mayors who are bought into this. I'm really proud of our partnership and collaboration with the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration, who have been willing partners in our decision to use federal highway dollars for a program such as this. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, what, what most people have a tough time understanding at some point is that the Greater Nashville Regional Council would be the definer of the rule sets that determine what is smart, what is not smart, what is helpful to the community, and what is not and those rules change and they're very dynamic. So people in their daily commute can experience that and the interaction, the relationship that you'll have is direct. And that's a part of what we're talking about today is how to get people from where they are to where they need to be for work today and how to get them from where they are to the city of tomorrow that we're all trying to get to. And with that, I'd like to introduce James Kuffner. You are the architect of Woven City, you, you are driving this boat, and you are the autonomous uh, engineering and thought leader at Toyota. And uh, I should just say thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure to have uh, the chance to talk to so many uh, esteemed uh, colleagues and uh, passionate people around the world. One of the things that I've been working on for my career is trying to create new technology for mobility and also to really think about how technology can help humans live happier, healthier, better lives. And that's really what's driving uh, the Woven City uh, effort. But when we are thinking about human activity, what you can see is that, you know, for thousands of years, people have been moving and building things and communicating and thinking. And we've developed manufacturing technology that uh, have uh, allowed us to build things, uh, transportation technology that has helped us move farther and faster than we ever could, and, and using manufacturing technology to build some of those uh, solutions in transportation. Uh, and then, of course, something we've all lived through is the revolution of information technology allowing us to communicate uh, using platforms like we're using today. But what is really interesting is that now we have artificial intelligence, which is essentially allowing us to accelerate and augment our thinking. And the computer is, of course, the most complex device that humans have ever built. And in fact, today's computer cannot be built without a computer. And in fact, uh, it isn't just a single computer. We now have data centers, network connected, thousands of CPUs, that are able to solve problems at a scale that was unimaginable just a few decades ago. And of course, when you connect a computer to the physical world, you get a robot, something that uh, uses computation to change the world. Or instead of processing bits of information, we can now process atoms. And connecting that to the cloud means that we can create all kinds of new possibilities, whether it's cloud-connected vehicles, or cloud-connected machines and robots. So one of the things that we've been looking at is how does all of this uh, new technology impact the way we live? And I think in many examples, uh, disruption and transformation comes with strong partnerships between the industry, scholars, and government, and also dedicated people and capital to make change happen. 
this is part of the reason that I became an early investor in Hitch. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, for me, uh, some of the first experiences I've had is in the DARPA Grand Challenge, where the government invested in trying to accelerate automated driving technology by inviting universities and companies to build proofs of concept and have competitions. I was involved with the Carnegie Mellon team in uh, when I was a professor there. And then after that happened, Google recruited a lot of the people that were building those tools and technologies uh, to try and accelerate it. And then, of course, uh, that has increased uh, dramatically now. Uh, that division is spun out as Waymo. But there's an explosion of research and development activity in this area because I think people are realizing that it has a chance to completely disrupt a lot of our mobility and transportation systems. I think the key point is data is critical. And we saw earlier how data about commuting and data about how people are moving in our urban environments is essential to make good decisions and judgments and also to incentivize behavior. When we think about machine learning, what's so interesting today is that any one of us could right now download the most advanced machine learning algorithm. It's mostly open source. You can get the state of the art software right on your laptop today. The problem is you wouldn't be able to do much with it without data. And it's not just quantity of data, but it's really quality of data and diversity of data. If I have millions of miles of data of driving in an abandoned highway in Arizona, I'm not going to be able to train a machine learning system that will help my car or my robot navigate through the streets of San Francisco. So that is one of the keys that is essential for this technology. And now I'd like to think about how this technology will impact the design of future cities. We're seeing this concept of true driverless cities where everything could be on demand. You could essentially have all of the services of people, goods, and information delivered for you. And COVID has actually accelerated the thinking about it because so many people are ordering food or ordering goods to be delivered and staying at home and remote working. This, of course, could lead to a dramatic reduction in traffic, noise, and pollution. Some of the things that the Hitch platform uh, is also aimed at reducing. And then if you think about city design, so much land that is currently dedicated to parking lots could be converted to better uses. On that point, the interesting part about the current reality is that the average car has a very low utilization. It's parked 95% of the time with only 5% on the road. Whereas urban drivers often spent up to 20 minutes just looking for parking. And of course, with connected cars and with smart cities, we could dramatically reduce that wasted time. The United States has about a billion parking spots, but only a quarter billion cars. And therefore, we have four times more parking spaces than vehicles, which is, of course, isn't a great use of our land. In the Los Angeles is probably one of the uh, most challenging urban centers. They have 200 square miles of land dedicated to parking, which of course could be used for much better purposes uh, and about 18, 6 million spaces. It's 14% of all the land area in Los Angeles, which is kind of mind blowing. What we can think about tomorrow is we will have, uh, of course, a relocation of parking structures away from urban centers you can actually build completely automated centers. They have them a lot here in Japan that dramatically reduce the space needed for parking. Essentially, you can have more dense and robotically managed parkings. You can also have denser uh, packing because you don't need to have humans moving around those spaces. But the data-driven dispatch of this transportation and dynamic load balancing uh, will dramatically improve the efficiency and uh, of utilization of not only people's space, but also time. I think also in the future, they can double as charging stations as well as maintenance for these shared mobility. And of course, maybe in the future, they could become logistics hubs. That means that if you order something online, it can be delivered directly to the trunk of your car. In the larger sense, converting uh, these parking spaces and gas stations to green spaces would dramatically improve the livability of many of our cities because now we can install green bike lanes or expanded sidewalks. 
could also think about having underground spaces, much like the Fußgänger zone is pedestrian zones in Germany or other parts of Europe. The urban centers are very vibrant and safe when you have no cars moving at high speeds in the centers. All of this, these technology changes and these possibilities has led Toyota to start thinking about smart cities. And so early in January, before COVID hit, we announced at the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, our president, Akio Toyota, and uh, famous architect, Bjarke Ingels, uh, are collaborating on building the Woven City, a smart city where we can test uh, these new technologies. It's at the base of Mount Fuji. This is the uh, rendering of what it will look like when complete. And the goal is to have very much human-centered a uh, living laboratory that is ever evolving and really trying to explore how these new technologies could transform the way we live and work in the future. This is the site. It's about uh, 0.7 square kilometers. It's the site of the old Higashi Fuji plant. And this is going to start early next year. Uh, we're already deep underway with the designs. But one of the things that is uh, interesting is that as these technologies come together, it's not just the infrastructure that we build that can create a better living environment, but it's really about the behaviors. And that's where I think Hitch and the Hitch platform comes in, is that how can we create incentives and create infrastructure for people to have good behavior that contributes to less pollution and better quality of life? This is a digital twin uh, rendering. Uh, we are now building, of course, detailed 3D models of what Woven City would be like. It's meant to have smart mobility uh, connected as well as uh, sustainable construction, mass timber-based construction that will allow people, goods and information to move seamlessly uh, within the city. Of course, it isn't the city itself that is important. It's really the fact that we're able to test some of these new technologies at scale with real people who are living and working in the environment and then take that technology and uh, utilize it for all of the cities of our world that are growing and increasing uh, demands for energy efficiency, sustainability, traffic and pollution. So that were the mostly the prepared remarks that I had today and I wanted to have uh, the rest of the time for a good discussion. But for me, I feel that the uh, technology and the uh, platforms such as Hitch that are allowing data and incentivizing good behavior are going to lead to a much better solutions for our planet. And that's something that I'm really passionate about. And I'm uh, really excited to talk with all of the other passionate people here gathered to find solutions for our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. The first question you're going to get is actually from the president and CEO of the Center for Automotive Research. Her name is Carla Bello. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And great presentation, James. Nice to see you. You were speaking my language when you were talking about smart cities and uh, this uh, idea of seamless transportation and green environment. These are all things that we're studying here at the center. And I posted a question in the Q&A about the citizens' involvement in really creating what this image should look like, and why is their involvement critical to the different technological solutions that you may choose? And then can you also elaborate a little bit on public-private partnerships and why those are so important in this kind of a, a multidisciplinary offering for, the, for a new way of living? Yeah, so for your first question, uh, thank you very much and great to see you, Carla. The Citizen involvement, I think, is crucial because, you know, how people living their lives, the choices that they make, they're part of a community. We're all part of a community and having a voice um, to how we prioritize infrastructure and how we prioritize the investments in our communities, I think, is very, very essential. It also means that you will get good ideas because you will have a diversity of people in different situations with different needs. So giving those people a voice, I think, is essential. And that leads to the second question, which is why is uh, government uh, public-private partnerships so essential? The public service sector uh, helping organize our communities, provide sustainable, efficient, safe mobility for everyone. The industry has been developing technology and, and we've been trying to create this efficient energy 
costs, effective solutions, and safe mobility. But we need regulations and we need to cooperate with governments to bring it to market. And that is something that the, um, the auto industry, but uh, many other industries uh, rely on in order to have our technology uh, making an impact. Uh, otherwise, it will be living in the laboratory and not able to make an impact. So for me, I feel it's essential that we need to have these dialogues and have these strong partnerships. And uh, without that, we will not make forward progress. Thank you. And and Michael, I, I have a question about behavior and changing people's behavior. I think Hitch has a wonderful platform to do that with incentives. We see a lot of places around the world that are using a stick as well. I don't know if it has to be a combination of both, but in your work so far, what are you finding is really driving a change in consumer behavior? Well, you know, just to be clear, we haven't yet deployed Hitch across the region yet. So we're more, my remarks earlier today were more about sort of where we're headed with respect mm -hmm. to the rewards program. But, you know, I think, and this kind of links back to your previous question about citizen engagement, is that a lot of times transportation planners engage the community about solutions for the future. And then, you know, we brainstorm all these great ideas. And then if the product is always going to be like a, hundred million plus dollar construction project and climate where there's not enough money to build that stuff in the next 20 years. It's sort of deflating. Um, it's also the public, I think it's frustrated when the only solution that government presents back to them is a big construction project. I think those construction projects need to happen and they need to happen in a, in a well-designed way that's suited for the 21st century. It's not the construction projects of the 60s, 70s and 80s. But I think the public really appreciates uh, solutions like Hitch because it's immediate impact. Uh, they're part of the they're part of the solution right now. It's also a demonstration of our commitment to thinking about um, solutions that are lower cost and and more sort of real time impactful. I think also linking back to the previous question about the. Uh, private sector partnership here. I didn't mention this earlier, but another benefit of the program with Hitch is that, you know, most of this federal funding is 80-20, right? 80% federal share, 20% mm -hmm. non-federal share. And most of our projects tend to be, the other 20% comes from the government as well, just the state or local government. And so in the case of Hitch, you know, what Mark has committed is working with the private sector to raise that additional capital uh, to match these federal funds. So our, our federal grants are going further. The government money is going further when we do it in partnership with the private sector. And we're, we're building systems together. We're not just infrastructure systems and data systems, but also communications and marketing and policy systems together in a collaborative manner that just makes everybody feel better about the investment. Thanks. And James, one of the questions I often get asked is, you know, when you look at the future of cities, what does that mobility ecosystem look like? You know, we've seen a lot of changes in COVID where cities have completely redesigned streets, shut down lanes, put in bike lanes, scooter lanes. We don't know how sticky that is. What do you what do you foresee in this mobility ecosystem? What kinds of products are still to be developed or are needed to fill some of the gaps that exist today? Yeah, thank you, Carla. So I think all of us are seeing a rethinking of how we move and as I mentioned, the mobility of goods and people and information connected together with some new technology has opened up new possibilities. One of the things that we are really looking at is different form factors um, away from the traditional car. There's different types of mobility devices, personal mobility, you know, the scooters obviously uh, uh, as, as one option, but then how do you organize it? How do you make it better? How, how do you come up with charging infrastructure or uh, make availability that's safe and clean? And I think there's a huge untapped potential for things that we could do better if we had smarter uh, mobility. And that's one of the reasons we're investing in that. I'll just mention one example. Computer-aided design tools have dramatically accelerated the engineering iterations that we're able to do when we're building electromechanical systems. But for our cities, there isn't an equivalent digital tool that would allow us to do sort of thought experiments and that's something that we're building as part of Woven City is a digital twin of the city that allows us to actually generate and synthesize and simulate uh, mobility patterns. Therefore, we could run giant optimizations and say, okay, for 10,000 residents, how many personal mobility devices would meet peak demand at different times? 
where would be the optimal locations for charging stations, and then really uh, run those simulations uh, so that we have better design choices. It comes back to data, and it come back, comes back to patterns of behavior. We won't be able to make good decisions unless we can understand people's uh, patterns of behavior. And so as Michael mentioned, uh, you know, having data about commuting can obviously lead to better choices in terms of public infrastructure uh, investments. And so that's something that I think we can uh, utilize and will accelerate much more in the future as we connect digital technologies, new mobility solutions, and then uh, public infrastructure investments and incentives mm -hmm. for behavior. Essentially, we'd like to provide people choices and uh, provide mm -hmm. clean, safe choices. Getting people to use them, getting people engaged with that process was your question. And comfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Comfortable, comfortable with yeah. it. And we, we spend a lot of time trying to get to the population to get their feedback. And we a part of what we're trying to do at Hitch is take them from where they are today to tomorrow. So our next question, uh, Amy Ford is with the, she's the Vice President of Public Policy and Mobility on Demand with ITS America. First is really to Michael, and I, I used to be at the Colorado Department of Transportation where I was the Chief of Advanced Mobility, and we too were looking at these kinds of frameworks where you think about incentives for, for people's behavior, and actually paying them is really a unique approach, right? 10 cents a mile, 25 cents a mile, whatever we choose. How did you crack the nut of freeing up federal funds for that? And whether it's SDBD or you know, someone asked here uh, whether you could use CMAQ funds for that, obviously we all know there are quite a few benefit cost analysis ratios that you have to do when you spend federal funds. And so how, how did you guys decide to do that? Yeah, right. I mean, is it worth it to even interject federal funding into the mix? Yep. Well, and it is worth it if you don't have another option, right? And I think we see the federal funding as the stimulant to sort of get this momentum moving forward and then it probably becomes self-sustaining as other investors step into the game i think you know short of citing specific regulations why but i think the conversation that we have federal highway administration and tdot was one that recognized multiple angles to this there's a data acquisition angle uh, there's a planning and analysis angle that comes from the product that we're purchasing through hitch and then on the issue of incentives, it's, you know, in a lot of the, the regs, as you know, Amy, it's um, in the way that Federal Highway is, uh, is structured across, and it's often a, a state division office, uh, state division administrator is helping mm -hmm. to interpret those rules. So anything I say here right now may not apply in your state, you know, yep. depending on that interpretation that is held locally, uh, for better or worse. But I think uh, in, in terms of incentives, you know, we were able to to point to uh, places where we have maybe not paid the person directly for a trip, but we have paid for trips, whether it's bus seat guarantees on public transit, where we're helping to do operational subsidies and in a capitalized way in some cases for public transit or uh, in TDM programs where we're um, investing in things that are mm -hmm. aimed at shifting behaviors. And so we came at it from a couple of different angles and, it, and, and I credit our Federal Highway Division Administration for seeing a few of these angles on their own, especially the data acquisition angle, because I think the data in and of itself is probably worth the investment that we're making. We spent a ton of money on data. We're talking about a nine and a half dollar investment over a few years. It's going to get us a ton of data that's also going to reward people for, for good personal decisions uh, in their mobility. Thanks. I appreciate that. I'll indulge on one more question. And I know there's some others, but James, I'm curious, this integration of incentive, incentivizing behavior, payment slash pricing slash monetary incentives, and the integration with their built environment, like what you guys are doing with your woven project, you know, the idea that a vehicle may have the capacity to be incentivized with different behavior. Hey, drive at a different time, park here, I don't, don't leave now. And that uh, also attaches to the mobility on demand concept of let's say it's a shared mobility services providing that behavior for the individual who rides in said vehicles. Are you guys starting to look at that kind of integration within the Toyota framework of what you guys are doing, where it, it compares the vehicle, the pricing, the behavior patterns within the use of the infrastructure and then how the individuals may attach because I may not always be riding in the same individual, I, I, in the same vehicle. I know that's a big question, but I think that's one where everyone keeps thinking, this is where we could go, but um, how we prove that out is tricky. Yeah, and so one of the things that I've been starting with is building a team that will create a software platform for uh, you know, Toyota vehicles to start with, 
but the idea that you would essentially have an easy way to program and interact with a mobility device uh, and with smart infrastructure in the city. Uh, we do have V2X, which essentially means vehicle to anything. We can find the states of traffic lights. We could find the states of uh, crosswalks and the vehicle can understand that. And, and we can make safer decisions. Uh, you know, our technology goal is really to be able to build a mobility solution, a car that would never hit a person. Um, and can we make it smart enough that no, even if the driver does the wrong thing, it still will not hurt anyone. But I think your point about uh, the connected infrastructure, how do we realize it? I think, you know, smartphones, and that's why the Hitch platform is so interesting is because we now have geolocation data and if we build good infrastructure to preserve privacy and uh, have good security, then we can have these solutions deployed with confidence. And that's something that uh, obviously, you know, is a, also a big uh, challenge for everyone. But to me, creating these programmable mobility ecosystems is, is really at the heart of trying to uh, lay the foundation for these innovative new uh, applications that can incentivize good behavior and provide people choices. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. I'd yeah. like to welcome to the stage uh, the CEO of Murakami USA. It's our newest client, Michael Rodenberg. Question, you know, we, we're very excited about kind of being one of the first implementers of Hitch in a rural area. You know, we struggle with, like in so many places, with workforce. And we're hoping that this will be an opportunity to reach out to a demographic that normally uh, wouldn't have access to transportation. To the larger question about rural communities, for me, we have seen, especially in Japan, declining rural populations, which means that people are reducing train service, reducing bus service, and then it makes the problem worse because you get a downward spiral. Aging populations, uh, so people, you know, whether we like it or not, almost all of us will eventually lose the ability to drive. Um, that's another reason why this technology is so important, because you lose a lot of freedom when you lose mobility. And so uh, if you think about an elderly person who needs to get around, maybe lives in the in the rural areas, if they're seeing bus service and train service getting cut, how are they going to get around? Uh, and so I think mobility on demand and shared uh, services, uh, being able to find out when a ride is available through a hitch uh, could be also very interesting and provide people options. So I think there's uh, all kinds of benefit. Uh, you know, we focus about cities, but it really also affects the rural side as well. Excellent. Thank you. I think we're going to see, because of this recent pandemic, that more and more people are kind of moving to the countryside because they at least here in the U.S., because they have the opportunity to, to, to work remotely. So we're going to see how that, that impacts us as well. So thank you. Thank you. The number one question that we received was from uh, Vicki Lewis. Hi, Mark. And thank you, Jane. So my name is Vicki Lewis, and I'm in the city of Detroit. I am the president and CEO of VMX International. My question has to do more with the urban community and with mass tr transit being so limited. I'm wondering how are you addressing and getting your arms around getting folks in the urban community to, first of all, share rides, be encouraged to share. Secondly, to feel comfortable riding with folk that they might not know. I think that there's a, a excellent opportunity for a cultural coming to minds and meeting and, and exchange. Also, how are you getting that community, the urban community, which I'm part of, involved and to hear what it is that they're interested in with this excellent concept? That's an excellent question. And I think part of the challenge is that we do want to provide safe, clean infrastructure and mobility choices for people, but people should have the freedom to make those choices. So if somebody prefers, they can travel by themselves, but if they have good incentives or if we have the right infrastructure and make it easy or they can be rewarded, then uh, we can reduce traffic and we can reduce pollution and also provide other opportunities for people to uh, get to know each other uh, through these shared rides. Of course, it's challenging with COVID, but I believe that that is the future, that we will be able to have communities where people can live happy, healthy lives and have choices for safe mobility, getting around uh, conveniently. To me, I think the technology part is just one part. It also has a lot to do with our culture and our governments and our, our communities. 
how they support that and how they envision that for the future. But I think it's uh, important for companies to invest in green technology, to invest in safe transportation for goods, people, and information. And that's really what we've been looking at. I think that the greatest part of this uh, for the urban community is incentivizing, you know, uh, I think pay is very, very important, more important than anything. I mean, it's one thing to save trees and to be environmentally green and things like that. So I think that the program is a perfect fit for the urban community, and especially with some of these uh, the automotive companies building their facilities and having a way to, well, actually, what has happened is some of the facilities are built and the OEMs get tax credits for um, hiring people within the community. But the challenge is the lack of mobility. How do I get to work? How can I be there on time? And I think that this is the answer. I'm just um, wondering how we communicate that to this population where they understand that this is something that's good for them. And Michael, on your program that you've already rolled out, you know, partially. Have you run into any challenges within the urban community? Well, yes, yeah, so we haven't rolled it out yet, Vicki. We're sort of getting oh, okay. into the final stages of that. But I think I appreciate your question because whether or not we're successful, this is what we're going to test. We're going to test. Is yeah. there is there an incentive level that actually drives behavioral changes to address some of the social equity needs that we have within the, within the community to get to senior adults who don't have great mobility or ability to drive or low-income neighborhoods that you just don't have great mobility solutions available to them? What is that magic threshold that changes behaviors? But I think I'd say you, you were about to mention communication. Uh, so let's get to that too, because I think that the, the platform is amazing, is an amazing tool, but we need to build those trust networks and circles. And that, the, the platform itself isn't going to do that. And so thinking about our communications and marketing strategy in a multifaceted way, it's not you just put it out, put, put, out, put out an app and billboards. I mean, we need to really leverage the peer to peer networks that have made other emerging technologies very successful. People trust mm-hmm. their peers much more than they do government. And so I think we have to be really creative about how we get into the neighborhoods that we're trying to realize benefits. And that's got to be done on a, on a personal level more than a systematic level, to be honest with you. I'm super well, curious that you recognize that, yeah. And credit to the Greater Nashville Regional Council for studying the highly vulnerable population um, and looking at, ultimately, we're all going to be looking at ways to get people engaged today as we head towards this, this experience that we want to provide as leaders tomorrow. Hey. What a conversation. Now you can see why I was so thrilled to be able to bring this conversation to the Transit Alliance audience. Mark, do you have any comments? Um, you know, we, we have a call uh, coming in from Congressman Green. and Hi, this is Congressman Mark Green, and I so wish I could be with you guys today. I'm thrilled to see thought leaders from the Transit Alliance and the GNRC using technology to measure and motivate smarter mobility. Thanks, Jessica, for your leadership and for hosting a great conversation today. For our economic progress and recovery, we need innovative solutions that can impact people directly and reward positive change. It will save our road dollars and, more importantly, our fragile environment. No question today, just congrats to the mayors, TDOT, the GNR City, and Federal Highways for thinking outside the box. This is big news today for Middle Tennessee as a smart region getting smarter. Thanks and have a great event. So there you go. A smart region getting smarter. Um, thank you. So uh, let's see what Heidi, Heidi's got a question looks like for Sean. Just r- release everybody back to, back to uh, the direct questions. Hey, Heidi, welcome. Hi there. Glad to be here. Uh, Jessica, Mark, and Sean, I've worked with all of you in different capacities on the TCLA with Mark and at the GNRC with, with Sean and, um, and also with Jessica. Um, so I uh, am so excited about this. I think that this is just a wonderful, um, wonderful opportunity for different agencies to work together. And as the mayor of Oak Hill, it's great to know that I participated in the consensus among local mayors TDOT and the federal highway officials on the value and efficiency that can be realized here. I support the idea that we should innovate and test new transportation um, policy to support growth and prosperity and opportunity in our region. And so I just wanted to ask Sean, 
as a professional planner, what in your experience, research, and work with everybody involved in this project is the experience that you are most proud of or what resonated with you the most? I, I think some of it's still to be determined as we you know, don't have any de deliverables yet, but I think what we're excited about is that um, you know, traditionally, as, as I mentioned, we have kind of a, a set of solutions. And um, as you know, we've been hit with, with COVID, I think um, there's been a lot of transformation in the, the transportation world, just in traditional uh, traffic patterns have changed. And therefore, I think, you know, we have to be more adaptable. And I think one thing that's exciting about this and getting kind of real time data, as opposed to data like on an every five year cycle that we update and it only takes you know a global pandemic to to really like shift the assumptions that, that you're making so um, I, I think what we're excited about is as we've seen in covid in the pandemic as we've shifted to telecommute um, or working from home that um, the data cycle update cycles have become much more frequent where you're starting to see, you know, daily, weekly, monthly updates on traffic patterns, traffic volumes. Um, and that's really kind of something that has not been a necessity in the past because patterns have been pretty well defined and haven't changed dramatically. And so I, I think part of the opportunity of getting um, another source of real time updates uh, through Hitch users um, is, is a great opportunity as there continues to be fluctuation that we can really monitor and get a better handle on like what's happening in real time. So um, I think that that's one of the most exciting um, aspects um, from the like data and research side of things. And we like everybody else are continuing to monitor those trends to see, you know, where is the new normal? Where are we stabilizing? Um, because there may be a, a new normal where we never get back to a fully, um, 100% of people, you know, going back to, to work. Um, I think the, the other one, other thing I'll add is that, you know, long term, our long range plan estimates that we're going to add a million people by by 2045 to the region. And so there are, we need to continue thinking about these innovative solutions as well as as other solutions to on how we're going to fit all of these people and get them from point A to point B in the region. Great. Thanks. I'm excited. I really am. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I I am just humbled that both GNRC and Hitch would come to Trans Alliance to give us a sneak peek behind the curtain. I know that these rules have not been set yet and that this program has not officially rolled out, but it's still super exciting. And I, I see it uh, as such a great uh, next step for our region in order to start building that excitement and that demand for enhanced and improved transit, which is our mission. Um, as Dr. Kuffner said, individual freedom is directly tied to mobility. So dignified mobility is, is more than just something that we need. It is something that we deserve, especially in a region as large and as sprawled out as Middle Tennessee. We are the heart of Tennessee. We literally make this economy of the state work. We pump it. Um, and I feel like uh, like uh, when you kicked, when the GNRC kicked off the RTP plan, the Unified Transportation Plan, he had a call to action that it just keeps ringing in my ears that it is up to us to make changes, to, to do something and to change our transportation infrastructure um, and, and access to transit so that we don't choke the arteries of our economy. Um, and so this is one of those things, just another tool in the toolbox to really drive and motivate change and in individual behaviors, which is going to be critical in, in any larger infrastructure build. Uh, build out. So and I do you. see Jim Hollingshead asked a question about people who are transient through this region. And I, and I think that I can address it. Michael Skipper actually addressed it directly where there's a potential to incentivize people for taking off routes. Uh, that's happening with the city of Spring Hill today. Uh, that's happening with uh, Brentwood and, and the city of Franklin are, are using Hitch now. There are companies that are using Hitch today to accomplish their, their congestion and their job 
uh, recruitment objectives and will be leaning into this project and will actually have a first mover advantage here in Middle Tennessee. Um, so I do do want to focus. It's a smart region. It's got to start with the people who live here. Um, and then we can work. I spent 20 years in transportation planning and uh, for, for fleets. And we know that with the pandemic, the traffic patterns have changed. I went out today, looked like an awful lot of traffic to me. And uh, I just think that as we return to whatever normal feels like, one of the things we know is that freight traffic moved a lot faster in the last uh, you know, eight months, and uh, they're happy to have us off their roads, and we all want them off our roads, and we all want someone else out of their car and into something else. And the truth of the matter is, we each make those choices individually. We we make them based on incentives, time, convenience, all those things. Uh, but there there is an answer to that question. The answer is yes. There are uh, methods using the, this platform and and others. I'm sure that will come along at some point. We we may be the first, but we we probably are not likely to be the last. And uh, we're just going to be better at it. And we're going to be better at it because of this leadership from GNRC and from the enthusiasm and the education that the Transit Alliance has invested in over so many years. Um, to get us to a point where we're ready to look at some alternative method of of managing congestion, pollution, and the impact that we all feel when we're all on the road at the same time. And sustaining our economic um, competitiveness and a whole host of other things. And I wanted to add, um, that's what makes this program so beautiful, right? It's not static. Good point. Uh, you know, I think we tried to make that point, and most people don't get it. The needs of the individual the needs of the local community, the needs that are reflected by what assets, what mass transit asset is available in City X or Corridor Y or Community B, 100% of those variables are taken into account in our system so that we can sort of the man behind the curtain, you know, the GNRC has this incredible opportunity to take their deep data perspective and dial up an incentive here on Friday and then dial up an incentive here on, on the morning commute and do things that are not possible in any other methodology. And I don't know anybody that's capable of doing it except what's happened here in Nashville. Credit to the Nashville Technology Council, credit to the Nashville Chamber, credit to this collaborative environment that Butch Spiridon talks about so often. Um, and I think we're going to take it to the next level. And we now can communicate publicly a little bit about what a smart region looks like. Sean, thank you for joining us today. Any parting comment? So much for letting me be a part of this. And uh, we hope to do uh, another event like this in the future with uh, so some of the lessons learned and, and impacts of the implementation. Well, thank you. Charlie Apigian and the MTSU Data Science Center, those guys can't wait to get at the solutions, the insights that will follow from this study. So thank you very much. We're going to end the session and go into some uh, communications at the table and welcome and thank you everybody.